It's not often that you need surgery for a stress fracture, but there are times where going under the knife gives you a better chance of returning to 100%. Today, I wanna to cover why you may need surgery, the specific locations that are at a higher risk of needing surgery, and a few different surgical considerations. First, we've gotta cover risk levels. Fractures in different bones of the body have different levels of risk. Some bones are better designed to deal with stress fractures than others. This is normally a combination of their unique anatomy and their specific blood flow. This table by Honing and colleagues divides different skeletal regions into low and high risk. Low risk sites like the tibia and metatarsals have a more favorable outcome. They have better blood flow and their unique biomechanics put them in a better position to heal. We're not worried about continued activity affecting the long-term outcomes of those injuries. This is very different than high risk locations. The forces going through a specific location play a role in the likelihood of that healing and their risk levels. Bone is better adapted at healing from bone stress injuries involving compressive forces. The lateral aspect of your lower extremity has to deal with more tensile or tugging forces. That's why we see locations involving high tensile loads as high risk, specifically the anterior tibial cortex and the lateral aspect of the femoral neck. The second variable in determining risk is blood flow. Certain aspects of your lower extremity have better blood supply than others, and specific locations within your bones have no blood supply at all. We call these avascular areas or watershed areas. Bones like the navicular and the proximal aspect of the first metatarsal have risk watershed levels. areas that are going to affect their likelihood of healing. We use the term non-union when describing a fracture that has not healed completely. This affects 5 to 9% of all fractures and is at a higher likelihood of happening in these high-risk locations. Non-union will be determined off of a specific timeline, radiographic criteria, or a specific clinical examination. Often all three of these variables are used when determining if a fracture has no potential for healing. That's when surgery is often warranted. When dealing with runners, there's three high-risk locations we need to be concerned about. The anterior tibial cortex is a common location for bone stress injuries, specifically in long or triple jumpers. These are rare in distance runners, but can happen, especially in runners that have a distinct heel strike. Of all tibial bone stress injuries, the anterior cortex is injured in five to 15% of fractures and come with a high risk of ending an individual's military or sport career. These are often misdiagnosed as shin splints or some other type of lower extremity injury. This is a rare location that might be caught with a simple radiograph exhibiting a dreaded black line through the anterior tibia. When surgery is warranted, often a rod will be placed in the tibia to allow the fracture to stabilize. But research on surgery versus conservative management of this location is mixed. Johansson and colleagues reported a conservative return to sport rate of 55%. Orava and colleagues found that 93% in one study and 53% in another of anterior tibial stress fractures did not unite after initial conservative treatment. We don't have great success rates for anterior tibial cortex stress fractures, whether you have surgery or you manage them conservatively. Your navicular is a boat-shaped bone wedged between your talus and cuneiforms and must handle large amounts of stress due to the surrounding bony tissue and muscular attachments. The navicular has a watershed area throughout the central third of the bone, highlighting its lower potential of healing. Again, research is mixed on conservative versus surgical management. Malley and colleagues found a quicker time back to sport with surgical versus conservative treatment, but Torg et al. found no difference in surgical versus conservative return to sport rates. Potter et al. found the same findings of no difference in surgical versus conservative management. When an athlete does end up going under the knife for a navicular bone stress injury, there's a few different criteria criteria that help determine the best surgical intervention. Nunley and colleagues proposed surgical interventions for displaced stress fractures, non-displaced complete fractures with sclerotic changes, comminuted fractures, failed conservative management, and athletes that can't take a longer rehab. We have mixed results on surgery versus conservative management of navicular bone stress injuries, but if someone does end up going the conservative route, it's crucial they understand how to manage those early stages. It's been shown that athletes need to be non-weight bearing in a casted environment for six weeks in order to improve their results. A study by Torg and colleagues found that subjects that were allowed to weight bear or didn't immobilize immediately only had a 47% success rate. Most metatarsal bone stress injuries are able to be managed conservatively because of their blood flow and the forces going through them, with the base of the fifth metatarsal being an exception. Bone stress injuries through the fifth metatarsal are divided into three different zones. Zone one occurs at the base of the fifth metatarsal and is common with inversion ankle sprains. Zone two is commonly referred to as a Jones fracture 
fracture. And zone three occurs at the proximal diaphysis and is the most common location for fifth metatarsal stress fractures. The non-union rate for zone one is only 0.5 to 1%, while zone two and three has a 25 to 28% chance of non-union without surgery, a 67% chance of delayed healing, and a 61.1% chance of refracture if treated conservatively. We don't have definitive evidence on surgical versus conservative management, even in these high-risk locations. It's important to understand the likelihood of success with each approach and the risks if someone chooses to go the conservative route. Early diagnosis is crucial, as well as working with a skilled physician and rehab pro that understand bone cyst injuries and their many implications. I hope you found this video helpful. 